6.30 p.m. Good evening, I'm Chiu Lin on News 5 tonight. PM Lee on the future of HDB upgrading and why Singaporeans should take a positive view of the elderly. A joint team of experts has been set up to study and rectify MRT problems after recent disruptions. It has angered many commuters and rightly so. Analysts say Singapore's 4 billion US dollar pledge to the IMF is a small price to pay to help ease global economic woes. And an initial report on last night's deadly plane crash in Pakistan reveals that the jet may have exploded in mid-air. Now, the Housing and Development Board marked the end of the main upgrading program for first-generation public housing estates today after 22 years. But speaking at a ceremony tonight, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong said it's not the end of the road for upgrading. In fact, there'll be more targeted enhancements for newer HDB estates and homeowners will have more choice under schemes like the Home Improvement Program and Neighbourhood Renewal Program. The main upgrading program has come full circle, starting and finishing at Ang Mokyo. Tegi Grandeur is the final precinct to be completed under the initiative. More than 120 precincts have had MUP. More than 130,000 households have benefited with the bigger flats, better facilities, better toilets, better living conditions, and more valuable flats because as the flats have been upgraded, the value has gone up. But for the government to continue to do this, Mr Lee said Singapore must continue to have a vibrant economy, peace and stability, as well as a good government. So he urged Singaporeans to continue supporting one another in the community. And as the country's population ages rapidly, Mr Lee called on Singaporeans to develop a positive mindset towards elders. He made this point earlier at a party to welcome residents of Tegi Vista when new replacement flats were built under the Selective on Block Redevelopment Scheme. In his address, Mr Lee highlighted the importance of recognising the contributions of the nation's seniors, saying that they should be supported in their silver years. He added that Singaporeans should treat the elderly the way they wish to be treated when they grow old. And so I encourage residents all over Singapore to show support the next time we need to build facilities for senior citizens in our midst, whether it's studio apartments, whether it's daycare centres, whether it's nursing homes, we all need them. It's not for somebody else, but it's for ourselves. Heartened by the manner in which the old and young managed to bond in Tegi Vista, Mr Lee, who's also MP for the area, said this is the way it should be in all new towns. The Transport Minister says a team of experts is going to examine current and potential problems with the public rail system and make sure they are properly rectified. This comes after a series of disruptions in the past week. The experts are from the Land Transport Authority and train operator SMRT. Train service disruptions on the Circle Line on Wednesday happened after delays on other lines early in the week. I was gravely concerned over the speed of disruptions. It has inconvenienced many, many commuters greatly. It has angered many commuters. And rightly so, because they expect and deserve a much more reliable service than what has been delivered over the course of the past week. In a meeting with SMRT's management, Mr. Lee was told that a team of experts has been set up to not only look at the train disruptions, but potential problems. They would be able to tell us more about what are some of the series of faults and problems that the trains will face as they age. And then with that information that we get from them, together with the builders of the, of the train systems, we will be in a better position to prepare ourselves for potential vulnerability areas, potential faults that may not even be surfacing uh, to the extent uh, that we would see in the future. In addition, SMRT is taking steps to do complete replacement of component parts when necessary, as opposed to only replacing parts when they break down. The Transport Minister also said that SMRT needs to improve its emergency response plan. This means giving out information to commuters in a more timely manner and ensuring that drivers of bus bridging services are properly briefed. Mr. Louis acknowledged that breakdowns do occur, but said it is important to keep serious disruptions that affect thousands to a bare minimum. Only then, he stressed, can the confidence of the public be regained. 
Analysts say the four billion U.S. dollars that Singapore has pledged to the International Monetary Fund is a small price to pay if it can help ensure the health of the global economy. It's part of 430 billion U.S. dollars raised by the IMF, doubling its lending power for crisis intervention. IMF members are discussing future action plans today. The four billion U.S. dollar loan facility represents just two percent of Singapore's 243 billion Sing dollars foreign reserves. It's part of 430 billion U.S. dollars of additional funding pledged by a group of countries, including China, Russia, Australia, and Japan, for the IMF to draw down should the need arise. The effort to bolster the IMF's resources comes amid a new wave of nervousness over Europe's capacity to avoid a full-blown financial crisis. Investors have retreated in recent weeks, largely reversing a bullish start to the year in financial markets, as Greece, Spain, Italy and even France face new budgetary challenges. Investors need assurance that the IMF, playing a central role in stabilizing the debt crisis, has the resources to cope. I think uh, when uh, speculators know that you know the IMF and the European Union has enough resources within its means to prevent uh, a sell-off in the European debt market, then the chances of that sell-off happening is also diminished. Singapore's latest contribution to the IMF is a contingent loan, which will only be drawn down if needed. Until then, the money will remain part of the country's foreign reserves. Like many other countries will have you know, a pledge to help out, uh, this will be a tiny amount if it were drawn upon and the idea behind there is like any other facility, they will be repaid back when the borrower pays up uh, in that sense itself. So it is basically just the MAS or government using part of the reserve to help out the IMF like any other member countries who are doing so at this point. It is not going to make a big dent to Singapore's reserves. $4 billion is clearly not a significant amount. But if you put the pledge in a wider context, if Europe you know, goes into a tailspin uh, and the crisis worsens and uh, you know, affects the global economy, this will have a bigger impact on Singapore than just $4 billion. While the amount pledged is relative, Singapore's desire to see stability in the world economy and therefore its own is central to this decision. The plane that crashed in Pakistan last night was flying too low and too fast as it came into land, causing the fuel tank to explode in mid-air. That's according to an initial report based on data from air traffic controllers. Pakistan has promised a full investigation into the disaster, which killed all 127 people on the Boja Air flight. It says it's examining all possibilities, from a technical fault to the age of the jet and even sabotage. At daybreak, this was the scene that greeted residents at the crash site near Islamabad airport. Debris from the crash was spread over a one-kilometer stretch of wheat farms. The plane's black box has been recovered and will provide crucial information. Dozens of coffins line the hallway at Islamabad's main hospital, where relatives have the grim task of identifying the victims and collecting their remains. The disaster is Islamabad's second major plane crash in less than two years. And now the age of the Boeing 737-200 aircraft has come under scrutiny. It was nearly 30 years old. But Boja Air insists there were no technical issues and the plane was safe to fly. Pakistan has blocked the head of the airline from leaving the country to ensure his cooperation with the investigation. Boja Air started flights in 1993 but suspended operations eight years later because of financial problems. It resumed domestic flights only last month. Well, the Qantas A380 that made an emergency landing in Singapore 18 months ago after a mid-air engine explosion is finally returning home to Sydney tonight. The airline says it's definitely safe and is in fact performing better than a brand new plane. Almost as good as new and finally on the tarmac. Qantas had the previously battered aircraft on proud display at Changi Airport. The aircraft, named Nancy Bird Walton, in honor of Australia's first female commercial pilot, was handed over by Airbus engineers to the same pilots who were handling the flight on 4th November 2010. With the entire A380 aircraft grounded for more than three weeks after the incident, however, Qantas says business has not suffered. 
Uh, the insurance company paid $139 million for the repairs, and Rolls-Royce have compensated Qantas for the ground in the aircraft for that period of time. So Qantas financially is whole, and we believe this aircraft is as good as new. Um, in the test flights that have taken place, it's performing better than a new aircraft would um, on delivery. It's a very young aircraft, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, as I said, it's the pride of the fleet, the flagship of the fleet, and if we, if we could economically repair it, we were always going to do that. The long gestation period to double-check safety measures may have also worked in Qantas's favour. Since that incident, the Qantas A380s have had very good load factors, have had a lot of demand, especially on those routes where they serve. I think that's a testament to the fact that passengers will make a conscious decision to go back to an airline if they feel that it is safe. After using 78,000 man-hours, Qantas has chalked up one of its biggest repair bills to date. But with four new engines, the Nancy Bird Walton is finally ready to return home to Sydney. And it makes its first commercial flight out of Sydney to Hong Kong on the 28th of April. And still to come on News 5. Flames and glass all fell down in front of the window where I was looking out. Aside from that, guests complained that there was no other warning that a fire had broken out at their hotel in Hong Kong. And scenes like this may be a thing of the past. Robertson Key residents can now rest easy after an intensified effort to tackle rowdies and rubbish. Welcome back. About 600 people had to flee their hotel in central Hong Kong in the middle of the night after a fire broke out. The blaze started on the 43rd story of the Harbour View Hotel. That was a non-residential floor, but falling debris set a lower level of flame. One guest describes what happened. I was just having to look at the window, and in the, the other, because it's the L-shaped building, in the window's glass, we could see flames above our room. And then all of a sudden, flames and glass all fell down in front of the window where I was looking out. So I just woke my wife up and said, quick, the hotel's on fire, we've got to get out. He adds that the fire alarms were not working, so he knocked on his neighbour's doors to warn them. Other guests also said the hotel seemed unprepared. Fire escapes were blocked and the staff didn't give any direction. One couple with a toddler said staff called their room two hours after the fire started and they had to walk down 22 flights of stairs that were smoke-filled and waterlogged. But there were no reports of serious injury or damage. The fire was brought under control about three hours later. For one would-be guest, though, it was a double whammy after his arrival in the city. We've just come from Hong Kong airport and they've given us a voucher to stay in the hotel. Um, we've just landed and they said, come here, the flights have been cancelled due to the rain today. And we've come to the hotel and it's on fire, so where do we go from here? Can you believe it? Two strong earthquakes struck Indonesia today but did not cause any tsunamis or major damage. You're looking at the aftermath of a 6.6 .6 magnitude quake in Papua, which sent terrified residents running into the streets. Officials say there was only superficial damage to some buildings. Earlier, a 6.1 magnitude quake rocked Sumatra. And back home, people living in the Robertson Key area may be getting a better night's sleep and cleaner surroundings. The problem of rowdy litter bugs has eased, thanks to a joint effort by police and the National Environment Agency. Well, the area is a popular spot for young merrymakers who hang out late into the night. But NEA has doubled the number of rubbish bins at Jack Kim and Robertson Bridges. Its officers have also stepped up patrols, leading to an 80% drop in the number of litter bugs caught. Public reaction is, however, mixed. There's a tremendous improvement on the littering part, but my main concern is uh, those youngsters, uh, after drinking, they will tend to break the beer bottle or the, you know, whatever glass bottle they will break it. Uh, and that is the main concern that will cause injuries to the child, you know. I see why somebody might complain, but I think we've all been younger. 
the government is launching a pilot project for eco-friendly upgrading in Jurong East. The green print project will benefit nearly 40 blocks at Street 21. HDB says it could slash energy usage in common areas by 30%, leading to cost savings of some $140,000 a year. For instance, energy-saving lights will be powered by solar panels or fuel cells, and there's a pneumatic refuse collection system. Trash thrown into the chute is stored in holding valves before being sucked into centralized collection areas. So no smell, no mess and no pests, meaning fewer cleaners will be needed too. The results of this trial will be used to refine the green print project before it's implemented in other estates. Marks and Spencer reopened at Wheelock Place this week in the spot where Borders Bookstore used to be. Our reporter finds out how it's being received. The new store is almost double its original size and offers a wider range of clothing and beauty products. Now the favourite part of the store for me has got to be the food hall which has more than 800 food and drink products. And where I'm standing right now is the first Marks and Spencer's bakery in Singapore which offers freshly baked cookies, pastries and breads which I must say is very difficult to resist. Despite missing forecasts for underlying fourth quarter sales in the UK, the retailer believes it will perform better here. We're very fortunate to have economies that are still growing. So we've got consumers who are still spending reasonably well. But what we have to do is to compete with the ever-raised standards that you can see in the rest of Orchard Road. While some shoppers welcome this new offering, others find it tough to shake off the Borders charm. Borders appeals to everyone because it books, magazines, uh, there's music as well. So. Uh, young and old, I think it attracts different people, a different spectrum of people. You get Marks and Spencer pretty much everywhere down the street of Orchard Road, but I would, I was actually quite disappointed that borders closed down. No matter what shop opens and we lock here, especially the first level, it should be okay, it can sustain. I like Marks and Spencer more because we have we are from Japan and we have Kinokuniya. So talking about bookstores, we don't need borders actually. The Orchard Road Business Association is confident the store will draw more shoppers. I presume that uh, Mark and Spencer's will do a much better job because uh, of the white offering uh, compared to a bookstore. However, I feel that as a greater Orchard Road, uh, we still need an Orchard Road uh, bookstore, perhaps somewhere on the downstream uh, that is uh, less costly. The association says it's integral that the store reinvents itself to cater to shoppers of all ages. And just ahead, we visit a zoo with a difference. One that's known more for its dead animals than its live ones. Tell you why. Plus, we'll have sport and let's tease you up first with a look at the latest result in tonight's EPL London Derby. Full details of Arsenal versus Chelsea coming up. time for sports starting with football. Arsenal and Chelsea have played out a drab goalless draw in tonight's early English Premier League match. The Blues, with one eye on their Champions League trip to Barcelona next week, fielded something of a makeshift side. They managed to keep the Gunners at bay, but they missed the chance to break into the EPL's top four. Arsenal, meanwhile, were frustrated in their efforts to tighten their grip on an automatic Champions League qualifying berth. Formula One's reigning world champion Sebastian Vettel has claimed his first pole position of the season at the Bahrain Grand Prix. He just edged out current championship leader Lewis Hamilton to top the qualifying times. It's also Red Bull and McLaren on the second row. Mark Webber was third quickest, followed by Jensen Button. Nico Rosberg, who won his maiden F1 title last weekend, was fifth after a thrilling final flurry of laps. The race has been overshadowed by continuing clashes between anti-government protesters and police. Overnight violence has left one person dead. Authorities have tightened security around the F1 race circuit. American singer and actress Cher appears to be selling her belongings on eBay through a third party. And it's caused outrage in Australia because she's even getting rid of... 
her key to the city of Adelaide. She was given the honour after performing at the 1990 F1 Grand Prix. Adelaide officials say they're disappointed and feel she should have returned the brass key if she no longer wanted it. Well, other people definitely do. As of this hour, bidding has jumped to 30,000 US dollars. It's not clear why Cher is auctioning her items. The Oscar and Grammy winner sold more than 100 million records in her heyday. And our last stop is Gaza, where there is an afterlife for animals in one zoo. And that's because those that die are simply stuffed and put back in their enclosures. A long-standing conflict with Israel is not only taking its toll on the Palestinians, but their zoos as well. Feeding the animals is simply becoming too expensive, and replacing them almost impossible. So this zoo in Khan Yunis has hit upon the idea of an entire exhibition of mummified animals. <laughs> But the art of taxidermy is still not quite advanced in the Palestinian territory, and the experience can be quite grim. In fact, the owner admits that he learned his mummification techniques after consulting the internet. But that doesn't seem to have stopped the visitors from streaming in. Conditions at the zoo are also harsh for its live animals. There are no zookeepers on its premises and medical treatment is provided after consulting with veterinarians in Egypt, over the phone that is. Still, the zoo is one of the few places of entertainment in Khan Yunis and a welcome break from the harsh realities of the battle-weary territory. And that's News 5 tonight. Good night.